And now, Deborah Colbelt Live. Hi, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us today on Deborah Colbelt Live. I have two very fascinating guests with me today, Valentina Castellani Quinn and Joan Borston Vidov. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank you. Deborah, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be in your show uh, once again and with such an exciting project. Um, I love it. You know, if I may, it's what you're working on. You're both producers of the Oleg Vidov story, um, which is such a compelling story about the struggle and the pursuit of freedom by artist Oleg Vidov, a beautiful and very talented film star from Russia. And I love that you're going to be presenting this film before the foreign press at the Venice Film Festival next month, aren't you? Yes. Absolutely, and we're very excited. September 4th, uh, Villa Ines, which is one of the most prestigious locations for the Lido in Venice for the festival. And we're gonna do a very beautiful international press conference uh, reviving the stardom of this fantastic actor. And um, I wanna say a little bit about how this story begin with me involved uh, uh, with this uh, Russian beautiful story. Joanne, who is the uh, former wife of uh, Oleg Widow, call me up and of course she's saying you know my husband died two years ago and uh, i would like to make a, a film documentary and uh, of course my first thought was who was oleg vito because it of course i'm italian it wasn't my generation but then as soon as i said it she was like this was the robert redford the james dean of russia and she showed me the pictures and I, of course i fell in love at first sight like the million people that still are, uh, Oleg Vido steals the benefits of thousands, millions of fans all over Europe, Russia, and, and so much more. And this is how we started a year ago with this wonderful, wonderful story. Well, what I loved, Joan, in particular, you know, he did pass away in 2017, and he passed away here in Malibu, where, you know, he spent his final years with you, correct? And I, I loved how he left you uh, information on what to do, how to tell his life story, because he wasn't just this incredibly handsome, truly heartthrob of an actor. His story on how he defected and how he came to America um, was so compelling in his entire life growing up. Um, that's a big job for you, Joan, that you were left with. He left me a mostly completed autobiography. Wow. And he left instructions on how to finish the autobiography. And mm. that is how the documentary started. So and that's how you two got in touch. Now, may I say to my audience, um, you're a very well-established journalist. You worked for the Los Angeles Times. Um, in fact, that's how you met in Rome, because at this point, Oleg had made his way through Rome. We're sort of jumping around a little bit, but I find that interesting that you met when? I think in 1985, is that right? July 4th, 1985. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> So you've been together for quite some time. So um, let's go way back to when he was a young boy. His mom was an educator, correct? And she worked for the government, right, pretty much. And they moved around a lot. And uh, tell me what that did for young Olive as a young boy, moving around a lot. He was a curious kid. Let's talk about him sort of from the beginning. Well, the Soviet Union was a locked country. Nobody could leave, but his mother... Right was asked by the, the Russian um, uh, education ministry to go first to, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, to go first to um, Mongolia. Mongolia, sorry. Mongolia, yes. And um, so he was there for two years and then they sent her to Leipzig, East Germany in Russian occupied Germany. Um, and so he already had a taste of foreign. And, but, and, it, and of course it was fascinating to him, but. He knew that even after he became an actor, he would never be allowed to go abroad because they never let anybody abroad. And, then and it was even, I'm so sorry, it was even tough enough for him to become an actor, right? I know that he, uh, he went to the very prestigious acting school there. And even so, that was, that was really, really tough because there weren't a lot of actors in, that, in the country. And um, like you said, no, they weren't even allowed to go out and, and act in other films elsewhere. Isn't that correct? At there the were, time, there were six places in the acting school and 400 applicants. Wow. And not only that, but uh, let's imagine, you know, we are in Hollywood. It's so simple to take an acting class and imagine, dream about becoming an actor. But this was the Russia of the Gulag. 
This was the Russia of no self-expression, of no imagination, of no religions, no spirituality, no creativity. And suddenly this boy, you know, that was uh, just uh, pushed to travel here, there with pieces of the family, the aunt, the mother, etc., that was dreaming to become an actor and had actually the courage to go against the system and pursue his dream. So it's yeah. unbelievable to the point uh, his imagination and passion to actually get to defect once he became the biggest movie star in the, in the USSR. So yeah. it's quite a story. And I think it's so important right now, especially in this fragile political time that the whole world is living nowadays to remember that creativity can overcome any border, any frontiers under the flags of, of arts. Absolutely. You know what it really impressed me too? He was a young boy and at one point he was staying with his aunt as opposed to his mom because she traveled so much and how she would take him to the cinema, to the Russian cinema and how that had such an impression on him. And it was that moment in time where he realized this is what I want to do. You know, and he was such a nice young boy and so beautiful. And I said this to you, Joan, because you were married to him. It's almost like he didn't quite realize just how incredibly beautiful he was, you know? It's true. He was humble. He was very, very, very humble. I believe, Kurt, we do have a clip from the film. Am I right? Do we have something like that ready? Because if not, we, we can keep talking we do. and then we'll go to that clip. We do, we do have a film, a clip from the film. Okay, do you want to go to that now, ladies? Yes. Okay, let's see that. People in democratic societies tend to take their freedom for granted. Growing up in the Soviet Union, this man's life was different. I was nervous. If the Yugoslav border police examined my passport, they would see I had no exit visa. In May of 1967, the Red Mantle provided Oleg another opportunity to travel outside the Soviet Union when it was selected for competition at the Cannes Film Festival. My dad told me that it was a great, great experience for a young guy from the Soviet Union suddenly to be in south of France with palm trees and cocktail parties. And the film was very well received as well. But that really gives people an idea, whether you're listening or you're watching it, his life, because that's him, right? I remember watching and I thought, wow, is that really, is that him? Is that the person we're talking about? You know, just everything that he had to go through. So let's, let's back it up a little. So he's in acting school. He gets these incredible opportunities um, in Russia to act, not necessarily what he would want to really do, but they were acting roles and he took them. So let's go from there. Uh, he's getting very well known in Russia to when he starts to realize that he wants to leave. There's a lot that happens in between, if we can tell that story. I will start and then I will have Joanne continue because for her it's actually personal. Yeah. Uh, so he becomes famous and obviously Russia is not the only country that discover his talents, beauty, possibilities and uh, all the eastern countries and the northern countries start to call him to work from Denmark, Yugoslavia, etc, etc. But at the time Russia would not allow a Russian actor to act outside of his country. So here we got the first, uh, not the first one, one of the biggest obstacles uh, after you think, okay, I became famous, I finally can star in all the beautiful films that gets offered to me, no. Then it's uh, no, no, you cannot get out of this country. We're not gonna give you a visa, et cetera, et cetera. And so wow. obviously he became really one depressed, angry, also, there is a, a first marriage that took place and had political contradictions. And again, those were the years of the blacklists. And if you were on a blacklist, you wouldn't be allowed to work. I mean, us as artists and people that works in the entertainment forgot nowadays what it meant actually, not only to make it, but to keep it 
and to keep expressing ourselves and being able to work internationally. So here there were so many obstacles up to the point. Go ahead, please. I see. No, no. When was he finally able to leave the country? Because he did get permission, right? To leave yeah. the country. And yeah. where was that film made? If you could tell people. And it wasn't a film. He, he, they, he discovered that there was a treaty that the Soviet Union signed. And it mm -hmm. said that there were two spouses from different countries. They had the right to decide which country. So he decided to marry a girl from Yugoslavia. And, and this is after his first marriage. Right. Okay, because that, that was a very political marriage. And then when that ended, he wasn't really getting much work in Russia, right? Exactly. So Brezhnev died. Right. And in 1982, the end of 1982, and he called this woman that he'd met from Yugoslavia, and he said, can we get married? So she came to, she came to Russia, they got married, and then he went and applied to go and see his wife. And they gave him 72 days. And that was the last right. time he was in Russia until many years later. Right. But let's talk about that moment and who helped him across the border um, at that point. You said it was the last time that he was in Russia, right? Um, let's talk about what he did in... He went to Yugoslavia. He made films. On one of the right. films, he met an Austrian actor who said, if you ever need help getting out of here, call me. So mm -hmm. one day, the Yugoslavians called Oligan, and they said that the Soviet Union wanted him back in Moscow pronto. And they said, but we like you. We know your movies. So it takes 72 hours to get back on your own. So he went downstairs. He called the Austrian actor. The Austrian actor flew to Yugoslavia. They went to the Austrian embassy where he had a friend, convinced him to give a same-day pa um, Austrian passport, a visa, in a Soviet passport, unheard of. And then they had to drive to the border, but he didn't have an exit visa. So they planned they were, he was going to run across the border late at night. And um, when they got to the border, the Yugoslavian border guards were watching a soccer game. And uh, Belgrade scored a goal. And they never even checked his papers. They just waved him through because they wanted to watch the TV. That was so, one of the most telling moments of the film. I, I just gasped. I thought, oh, my gosh. I mean, if that... If that score wasn't made, if that um, it, that might not have ever happened, it was so unbelievable because they were distracted, you know, by a sport game on television. I tell you, timing sometimes really can be everything. Let's go back a little bit. I think Valentina, you wanted to talk. Let's talk about when he went overseas and he finally did a film. He met Yul Brenner. He met, met Orson Welles. I mean, he was getting a taste of of freedom and what other actors were like and what you know the circumstances in which they were able to to um, honor their craft, right? What was that like for him? Yul Brynner was born in Russia. So that yes. was a very close connection for him. And he saw Yul Brynner, who was no longer a Russian, flying you know, to Bosnia to make the movie, from there to Rome, from there to Los Angeles, and back to Bosnia. And he thought, why can't I be like that? Mm. Yeah, I think that was exactly the moment that made him decide, I need to run away. And before that, I want to enhance the nomination at Cannes Film Festival which was unprecedented. That was his moment of becoming really famous worldwide. De Laurentiis, Dino De Laurentiis offers films, uh, French directors, Shirley MacLaine says, you, you should win the Palme d'Or for your interpretation. So that gave him a stature, an idea of how much he was appreciated and an urgency to escape at that point. So the Austrian border gave him entry and from there, he was basically on his own. He landed up in, in Italy, actually, and that's actually where he met lovely Joanne. And uh, it was uh, uh, Richard Harrison, an American actor working on the famous Roman movies, you know, about the Benur of the situation, you know, at the time, that gave him a uh, sort of hospitality. And of course, he was still very scattered, as you see in the documentary, you know, he was always turning his head and looking for KGB, you know, and that was the reality at the time for somebody what an, to escape. Yeah, what an awful way to have to live. I mean, you just want to be free and, and do your craft. And it's true. I mean, just watching the film, it was so beautifully done, beautifully written, um, beautifully executed with many of the interviews that you included throughout the entire film. Um, and also, you included most of his films in there. It was just just so well done. But I felt the tension watching this film. Um, and I felt the love that he also had for his people in yeah. Russia. It's not that he really wanted to leave. He wanted to leave his circumstances, right? 
guy. Yes, I mean he, he he loved being Russian. He loved the Russian culture. He just didn't yeah. love the government that they were under. Yeah. And imagine what it meant to escape. It's not like nowadays we take a plane and then we're allowed to go back. That meant to say goodbye forever to your family, your friends, your fellow actors, your country, your people. In fact, for for me, one of the most touching moment in the story uh, was when he says, these are my people, the rediscovery, no matter of the freedom, the success, the awards uh, he gets uh, in Europe, America, and so much more, he then, uh, you know, feels his connection to Russia and the, the need, the desire to go back. And that's yeah. very, very beautiful because instead of leaving just a sour memory, he still kept uh, that sentiment, that feeling of connection that we all are have for our country, you know, I'm and, Italian. And, so and I you know don't what know. The, the nice thing is his fans never forgot him. No, right? He was in Santa Monica and people were like, Oleg, Oleg, is that you? And that must have felt so good for him because at this point he must have been a little down, right? You go, you just keep going in life and you're fighting and you're, you're looking over your shoulder. Finally, you have freedom. And what a nice moment when they recognized him. You could just see in his face. He was so happy when that happened. Were you with him, Joan, at that moment? Yes, and it happened in the, it happened in the airport in um, uh, Hungary. It happened in the airport in Thailand. It happened all over Tel Aviv, you know. So years later, women who had fallen in love with him when they were fifteen emigrated to Israel carrying his picture. Oh, I love that. That is, you know, after all he had been through, you know. Um, let's talk a little bit about. So you only knew when you met in Rome. It was two months later, and he was already here in America. And here he is in Hollywood, looking up, and there's the Hollywood sign. You know, you come from an esteemed family yourself, Joan, here in Hollywood. You're a very well-known journalist. What did he say to you that that felt like after all he had been through um, and where he had come from? It was, like, I don't know, like heaven. He, like, couldn't believe yeah. he was here walking around. There was a Hollywood sign, you know, all of the Hollywood Boulevard. Um, yeah, probably a little sad, too, though, right? Because he knew he left so many people behind and if only they could experience that same freedom where they could just, you and know, then, walk around and, and a few travel. Years later, it happened. Gorbachev came and suddenly they didn't need an exit visa to leave. They could just come. And right. also I think one big point was like as a Russian, what yeah. kind of role he would be offered here in Los Angeles? Because mm -hmm. he came and obviously it was the, the lover, the soldier, the hero so many amazing role he covered in his country and here he was offered just the evil uh hardcore right right, right. And, i love that yes and that was a, the very defining moment where he's like no i need to find a way to have america and the world know russia under a different kind of lens and and i think that he really succeeded in that in many he did and I love how he uh, he was in a film with Arnold Schwarzenegger here in the U.S. and how those two formed a bond and how he watched Arnold and watched what, he, you know, he knew what Arnold had been through in his life and how he watched how, you know, the success that he had. So it was very interesting. He's a very smart man, clearly. And I'm working with the, with the animation, right, with the uh, Russian animation, which was beautiful that he grew up with. So it's almost like that came full circle. I mean, there were some issues involving that as well. But that was a real love project for him, wasn't it? He, he wanted to show the world that the Cold War image of Russians was wrong. And he decided that the best way to do that was to introduce them to this absolutely fabulous animation that the Russians had been making since the mid-30s that nobody had ever seen except in festivals. And right. It was a huge undertaking. Trust me that he needed everything that he learned as an actor to convince buyers around the world to buy this animation. Yeah. yeah. He was very successful doing it, and he really changed... Um, the, the vision of Russians at a very critical moment. Yes, and he did that in, in partnership with Barishnikov, but also these beautiful animation cartoons that were dubbed by the best and most successful uh, American movie stars. So that's yeah. quite interesting. 
And just to me, it showed again the love that he had of his country. And he wanted people to know the other side of Russia, where he's from. And it was the people and the talent that they had, because that animation was stunning. And I know that you had to um, revive some of it, but it was, it was quite beautiful. It was really a stunning thing. And again, a little later in his career, he got to go back, right? He was invited back. I don't want to give too much away, but he got to meet again. He got to see his, it was a real surprise. Should I give that away or not? I think I mean, it's it, important to say for the world that that was one of the few artists that was actually embraced back and forgiven by Russia and recognized as a national talent and hero, no matter the, the escape. So in that sense, I do want to speak very well about Russia because uh, uh, by the end of this long saga and adventure, uh, it was actually his country to understand that this guy did it right. This guy was uh, yeah. so passionate. This guy was bringing and carrying the color of his countries all over the world. And right. it and he, was a gesture of grace. And he was welcomed back, as you said, and he got to see his son. And there is a second son and grandchildren now that are here. It's a very long and complicated but beautiful story that honestly people need to see how can people here see this film now i know that it's going to be presented in front of the press right you're going to have a press conference about the, the film yes, press conference how and lots of festivals so it will be you know in the, in a series of festival and we will keep uh, all our audience updated in the meantime you can check us and get updates on the different festivals and screenings that in our website of the film, which is olegvidofilm.com. Yeah. Because in the end, really, we want the same thing. We want love. We want um, freedom of expression. And in the end, um, that's what he got. And I think he probably felt very full circle, right, having gone back and come here. But you would know that best, Joan. What did he talk to you about in his deepest moments, you know? Um, I, I think the most important thing for him was freedom. Yeah. And just wanted to be free. And I'm going to be very cliche, but he loved the fact here that nobody was looking at you every five minutes and maybe reporting you to our equivalent of the KGB. They would, everybody, wow. just pay, as he used to say, just pay your taxes and you can do whatever you want. He loved going in the ocean too. There's a great shot of him that you've got of him, you know, rolled up his jeans and there he is going in the Pacific Ocean. And I really felt him right there. I felt what he must be feeling. Um, it really came through. So it's just a beautifully done film. Anything else you'd like, you know, our audience to know about this incredible film and your journey, both of you producing this together? Good. Um, you know, we're expecting one of the um, great, you know, um, broadcasters on TV um, to pick it up and show it over and over again. And then people can, you know, watch it, whether they can't go to the cinema anymore or whether they can. We originally yeah. really hope that, that the theaters are going to open um, at least enough for us to show it for a couple of weeks because it was it was really we really did it for the big screen for at least a, you know the first showing mm. I valentina want say, yes i want to say we did we filmed and did the whole post-production of this film under COVID, and we finished in time and we're having a press conference at venice Film festival which is the first international film festival back on calendar and this was an unprecedented effort and achievement, even for myself that I've done uh, a, a few films by now. Uh, it, it was incredible. We all worked basically through Zoom with a director who is uh, uh, of Russian origins, but living in Australia, with a music composer, Andrea Guerra, which is one of the biggest uh, world composer, so he did the music score for Hotel Rwanda and got Golden Globe nominated, Pursuit of Happiness and so many more. Uh, and he lives in Italy. And then we have the post-production team here in America. So imagine us at one o'clock in the morning on Zoom calls <laughs> at 6 a.m., at 5 a.m. and all throughout the day with our team. This is a different time to make a movie, but it's a win that I want to celebrate. Well, Valentina, if anybody could pull this off, it's you. I know some of the work that you've done. So no, I'm going to just say it doesn't surprise me. But, you know, it's a real project of love. And it's an important project because um, in the, at the end, like I said, it doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter our governments. We really all want the same thing. We want, it. We want our freedom to be able to pursue our, what we love and our art. And this, comes, this really comes out in, in this movie. 
Um, I loved it very, very much. It really was very inspiring to me, um, which is why I'm thrilled that it's going to, go ahead. Yeah, often I think that it's through art that all the flags of the country gets united. No yeah. matter the war, the politics, it's often just art that gets and allow us to feel united, even just uh, for a screening, a film, an hour, two hours film. But in that moment, it is through art and, and the color of a film, of a painting, of a music composition that we feel united and human again. Yeah, it was beautiful. The Oleg Vidov story, I'm, I'm gonna um, implore everyone out there watching, especially if you're not really familiar with him, look him up. The first thing that I would see is, wow, is this man handsome? I mean, I know he's apparently the Robert Redford of, of you know, Russia, but frankly, I thought he was so beautiful and perfect looking. He's his own guy. I mean, that's, it was really amazing, but as humble as could be um, from very simple beginnings who loved his family very much, who loved his country. And in the end was welcomed back uh, to Russia, which I think was wonderful how the government welcomed him back and the people welcomed him back and forgave him for leaving in the first place. So it's really a beautiful story to tell. And uh, Valentina and Joan, um, will you come back and tell us how everything went? Seriously, after the Venice Film Festival? I invite you to our screenings. I don't know if you can make it in Venice for September 4th. I know that still there are problems with frontiers and tickets and, and passports and thing under COVID, but we would love to have you with us and certainly for the next festivals and special screenings and press conference. Uh, I think you understood the core and the essence of this film so, so well. Thank yes, you. Yeah, it's a beautiful you. film. Thank you both for joining us. Um, we do look forward to having you back after Venice. Um, I'll try and come. I know there's a, a few ways that we can get yeah. into Italy right now, but based on what's going on, I'm really not sure, but certainly next year, but at least for this year, I want to hear about how it was received because I think it's going to be a, a beautiful film and well received there at the Venice Film Festival. So congratulations to both of you Thank for you your you great so success. Uh, the Oleg Vidov story, uh, a magnificent documentary, it's about what, 90 minutes, I think. And um, I look forward to being able to watch it here with friends soon. Thank so thank you. you both for joining us at Deborah Cobelt Live. And um, everybody, you can find our show here on Facebook Live, and then we play it on YouTube. And then it goes out everywhere. You can listen to us as a podcast on Spreaker, on iHeart. And anywhere you get your podcast, video or audio, you can find us. Just look us up, Deborah Cobelt Live. And of course, the Oleg Vidov story. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.